Good morning. Um, welcome uh, to CSIS. I'm Olga Olaker. I direct the Russia and Eurasia program here. I'm also the person who you will be looking to for instruction in case of any emergency and the lucky moderator of uh, this excellent panel. Um, the defeat of uh, Daesh, the Islamic State, uh, Eagle, however you want it, whatever you want to call them, has changed the equation in Syria. Um, and perhaps it's not quite right to say after Syria, I think the conflict continues, but it does, the, the defeat of ISIS uh, does raise questions about what this means for uh, counterterrorism, for terrorism, and interestingly enough, with both Russia and the United States having their very own approaches to these questions, uh, how, we, how we will be looking at these from Moscow and Washington, and uh, how we'll be interacting with one another. And I couldn't uh, imagine a better panel to have this conversation. Um, we have um, Irina Zvagelskaya, who is the Chief Research Fellow at the Institute of Oriental Studies at the Russian Academy of Sciences and Professor in the Department of Oriental Studies um, at uh, Mgimo University and at the Institute of African and Asian Studies at Moscow State University, who knows more about uh, the Middle East then I'm going to wager a guess anybody here and possibly, you know, most people in the world. Um, Seth Jones, who holds the Harold Brown Chair and directs the Transnational Threats Project here at CSIS. Um, and uh, he, um, and is also an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins, who uh, has been writing about uh, U.S. counterterrorism and the development of uh, the terrorist threat for many years. Um, and is the author of any number of books, which you can buy at your local independent bookstore. And uh, Ekaterina Stepanova, who heads the Peace and Conflict Studies Unit at the Institute of World Economy and International Relations at the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow, uh, who has also uh, written the book uh, several times on uh, terrorism and uh, how to counter it. And uh, I, I think, um, you know, can, can, uh, is, is one of the most cogent explainers of these, of these topics that I know. Uh, we unfortunately lost uh, Kim Cragen, who was supposed to join this panel, but was called away um, uh, unexpectedly and uh, is, is very sorry not to be here. Before I turn to the panel, though, um, I would like to give um, a few words to Vladimir Ivanov, the director of the East-West Institute's uh, Moscow office. Uh, the East-West Institute just held um, a series of conversations about the United States, Russia, terrorism, and Afghanistan, and uh, he's, uh, he's the reason we are lucky enough to have Ekaterina and Irina here with us. So um, I'd like him to uh, take the have the opportunity to say a little bit about his project and their work before we get started. Vladimir. Thank you, Olga. Yes, uh, good morning. I just wanted to add a little bit of intrigue to uh, this panel. Uh, Again, uh, our colleagues from Russia uh, who are on the panel are coming here within, in the framework of uh, the program, which is run uh, from uh, our New York and Moscow offices devoted to U.S.-Russia relations. And uh, uh, they are coming here uh, as, part, as uh, members uh, of uh, a team of uh, Russian uh, members of the working group on counterterrorism in Afghanistan. It's a joint working group which was established uh, in October last year uh, by the East-West Institute uh, with the funding from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. And uh, we had uh, our second meeting, uh, actually three days meetings uh, uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, with uh, uh, seven Russian participants uh, and uh, more or less a similar number of American participants. And also had uh, some meetings uh, uh, with uh, uh, U.S. officials uh, in the State Department, uh, as well as uh, uh, the uh, U.S. Institute uh, for Peace. Uh, we actually discussed uh, a number of topics which uh, fit, uh, interestingly, into the current U.S.-Russia agenda, and uh, uh, which is particularly interesting uh, against the backdrop of current uh, diplomatic controversy uh, between uh, Russia's, uh, Russians and, uh, uh, Russia and the United States. And uh, the key focus of our, of our project is to find a common ground in this uh, difficult, turbulent time uh, for U.S.-Russia context. Uh, I would say that 
uh, our deliberations were very productive. Although we mainly outlined a lot of uh, disagreements in, between uh, uh, Russia and the United States uh, in the areas of counterterrorism and how we see the situation uh, evolving, particularly for Afghanistan, uh, nevertheless, uh, we found uh, a lot of topics uh, which uh, are of uh, common understanding. And uh, uh, we uh, particularly discussed uh, such issues as uh, the uh, uh, U.S.-Russia strategies uh, on counterterrorism, uh, how they uh, practically interact uh, in Syria, and what are the prospects for U.S.-Russia uh, uh, cooperation uh, or uh, coordination uh, in uh, Afghanistan. We see Afghanistan as a possible uh, area where uh, America and uh, uh, Russia could cooperate in the future, although uh, it is also a, a scene uh, full of contradictions. We discussed uh, the peace process in Afghanistan and uh, the possible implications of uh, the upcoming elections next year there for uh, fighting against terrorism uh, in Afghanistan and around Afghanistan. We discussed uh, many regional issues and how, uh, the, uh, how uh, numerous uh, key regional players uh, see the situation in Afghanistan and how U.S. and Russia could be engaged in, uh, uh, in uh, contributing to the stability uh, of this country in the future. Uh, this panel, which will take place here, uh, will be devoted mostly to uh, the issues of evolving uh, terrorist trends. We also discussed it in the framework of our project, and uh, uh, believe me, that that was a very interesting discussion. We uh, uh, this is uh, uh, this group works uh, currently in a in a closed regime. We do not uh, publish much, but uh, we are planning to issue a threat assessment report on, uh, on uh, terrorism in Afghanistan uh, at the beginning of the next year. Uh, with these words, uh, I would like to thank CSIS and Olga for hosting uh, this event here and giving an opportunity to broaden the discussion and to present some of our uh, conclusions and views to the broader audience. Thank you. Um, we will we will get started. Um, what I'm going to do is ask each of these panelists to give um, some brief introductory remarks, and then we'll talk amongst ourselves for a little bit before turning to you, our audience, for your questions. Um, and I think we're going to go straight down the line and begin with Irina. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank the East West Institute for bringing us to Washington this time. And of course, I would like to thank uh, Olga, who made this meeting possible. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to discuss here the issues which I believe are of great importance to all of us right now. So if we start from Syria, I would like to, men to mention first several drivers of the <laughs> Russian policy in the area, because as you know, there are so many questions concerning the goals of Russia and Syria, for example. So I would like to start with an intention to play a very important role <coughs> in fighting terrorism, along with the Western coalition. So if we look back to 2015, it was the main, the main uh, driver which shaped Russian policy vis-a-vis -vis Syria though there were also other considerations, like we wanted to prevent state failure, we didn't want to see the jihadist ruling in Syria and probably in other countries. Uh, Russia also had a goal of defending minorities, Christian first and foremost, and uh, there were other not so important considerations, though they really existed. But uh, as for the main idea to, to prove that Russia can, despite all differences, to fight along with the Western coalition against common enemy, namely ISIS. That was the main driver. Now, three years <coughs> later, we can sum up what really has happened. So first, uh, it seems that uh, fight, the fight against terrorism, international terrorism, 
is no longer a unifying factor. First of all, because we should recognize that ISIS uh, was uh, militarily defeated, the area which it controlled has shrinked almost to nothing in Syria. I'm speaking about Syria right now. And uh, so though uh, the fighters managed to get away from Syria, but this is another story. In Syria, ISIS is no longer a threat as it was uh, several years ago. But uh, at the same time, uh, the problem is that the differences between the two coalitions and between the United States and Russia went deeper in Syria after this positive result. First of all, because I believe that we very much depend now on our regional allies. Allies, of course, in inverted commas, as you understand. But still, uh, right now, we can uh, make a conclusion that the role of the regional powers, including non-state actors, has been on the rise. And they are really trying to take advantage of the two powers and of the two coalitions just to, to secure their own interests, which might have nothing to do with the fight against terrorism or with preserving the states and things like that. So um, as far as these regional actors are concerned, I can tell that we have difficulties with Turkey. Probably you have greater difference, uh, difficulties with Turkey, but no one is very happy about Turkey trying to secure a buffer zone at the expense of Kurds. Uh, and as you remember, the United States supported Kurds in their fight for for let's, let's put it as autonomy. It was not clear at that time what kind of um, configuration within the Syrian state they will have. But uh, as for Russia, Russia, as you know, probably was not a direct ally, but we insisted very much on uh, coining up a special Kurdish delegation. And Assad <coughs> and even opposition leaders, they were very much against it, saying that we have Kurds in our delegation, so why should we have a separate one? But it was really very important to ensure that Kurds will get what they need in, in Syria. Uh, so uh, it's really a very strange situation when Turkey still remaining and probably <laughs> will remain forever the member of NATO, at the same time is buying Russian S-400, and uh, has, well, uh, good relations with Russia, despite, as you know, the crisis which was there several years ago. Uh, as for Iran, it's also a headache, because on the one side, uh, Iran is very important for Russia because its importance go far beyond the Middle East. Uh, take uh, the Caucasus, for example, takes, take its policy in Central Asia. So for us, it is really important. It's our neighbor. In, uh, as far as Syria is concerned, Iran contributed uh, to the, to the uh, fighting with uh, ISIS, but at the same time, nobody knows what the post-conflict intentions of Iran would be, whether they would like to remain in Syria, whether they would like to have their bases in Syria. And here we also have to take into consideration the concerns of Israel. You know that we have very good relations, bilateral relations with Israel nowadays, despite the fact that we agree to disagree on certain issues, but still, still the relations are very good and personal relations as well. So uh, we, we cannot ignore what Israel is saying and what it is doing in, in Syria. Sometimes things which are unfortunately are detrimental to political settlement. Uh, so I, I just mentioned several players. We can, of course, uh, mention Saudi Arabia also. But uh, if we come back to the Russian-American relations, I would say that the results of our coordination uh, was a bit uh, ambiguous and ambivalent. Because on the one side, we cannot deny that we managed to work out together at the Security Council the resolution 2254, which is very important which is practically the core uh, resolution for the, uh, for the uh, solution of the, of the Syrian conflict. And um, it's even a sort of a um, map 
uh, which shows us by stages what should be done in order to reach political settlement in Syria, uh, including transitional period, including uh, elections, including uh, the um, uh, new constitution and things like that. But, and we also have a very effective deconflicting policy in, in, in Syria. But it seems now that it is not enough. Because with the ISIS gone and with the territories which it controlled, liberated, the two coalitions are getting closer together, even territorially. And it might be dangerous because certain groups might try to uh, run into risk. And you know there were uh, already such uh, collisions, I, I mean the contractors, these were private contractors of course, but still uh, it was uh, very uneasy to find out that uh, they were killed by the Americans. They do not belong to the Ministry of Defense, but they are human beings, you know. We cannot ignore it. So, uh, and this is a problem because uh, uh, we, our uh, uh, goals in Syria now are getting further apart because we do not have a common, a common uh, approach to the future, to the political future of Syria, including Syrian regime. Though I would not say that anyone right now insists that stepping down of Assad is a precondition to, to, any, to any solution. It's not true. But uh, we still we know that uh, Western coalition and its allies, they simply uh, would, not, would not bear uh, the stay of Assad for a longer period than is requested by the re re resolution 2254. Uh, I, uh, as far as the political process is concerned, you know that now there is, unfortunately, uh, there are no positive developments in Geneva, and the process in Geneva is frozen. Uh, Russia was trying to use its, uh, its uh, regional allies or partners to, to uh, make a new process, Astana process, which you know, which was not thought of as a um, uh, substitution, of course, for Geneva, but on the contrary, as a process which might probably help Geneva, because uh, to start with a peaceful solution, you have to start with the situation on the ground first. You have to stop fighting on the ground, you have to introduce ceasefire, you have to bring humanitarian aid to the people. So the idea was of setting up several de-escalation zones. Some of them were, uh, were successful. In the south, for example, where Egypt and Jordan also participated and took, uh, and really helped to establish such a zone, it was successful. But at the same time, we do understand that there are certain zones where uh, the terrorists, like Al Nusra Front and others affiliated with Al Nusra, where well, they actually have their hotbeds and uh, where the fighting still continues because of it. Like Eastern Ghouta, for example, because as you know from Eastern Ghouta, they were shelling Damascus every day with 30 persons uh, killed every day. And of course, for us, it was a sort of existential threat. And so the reaction was this, as you know. So. And, and what is really bad about it, that unfortunately uh, there were a lot of uh, civil population and many people suffered during these bombardments. But uh, the problem was that uh, these uh, Anusra fighters, they, you, know, you know, they practically dug out a sort of underground city, underground town, where they had all what they needed. And so the people, they, they just lived as they used to live in Eastern Ghouta, but it was very difficult to get to the terrorists or the extremists themselves because they were underground. Uh, so um, another example is Idlib, where we also have a very complicated situation because of the same reasons. Many, what's more, that many fighters who were squeezed uh, out from other areas, they came to Idlib, and uh, it seems that Turkey wants to take care, or will be forced, I, I won't say it once, but probably it will be forced to take care uh, of, uh, of Idlib, of the situation in Idlib, but again, uh, it means that the force will be used, because I, I don't see how otherwise this, uh, this uh, problem can be solved. So uh, I'm naming all these issues just to show that the situation in Syria is far 
from, from being stable. And I really don't know how much effort would be needed and how long time will be needed to improve it. But what is absolutely obvious that this time we need on the one side coordination with the Western Coalition, with the United States in particular, and on the other side we need coordination with regional actors. Otherwise it won't work. And um, I'm not describing here pluses and minuses of the Russian policy because I believe that we managed, probably it will sound strange nowadays, but we managed to establish good relations practically with all players, with Iran, with Turkey, with Israel, with Saudi Arabia, uh, well, you name it, practically every country. But we cannot establish good relations with the United States and vice versa. And this is a problem. And that is why I believe still, though I have lost a lot of optimism really, but I still might believe that Syria and other conflicts in the Middle East can be used instrumentally just to improve our relationship. Not at the global level, but let, let's say only in the region. Because it is necessary for us. Uh, it's necessary because we need to stop, uh, to, to press down the tensions in the region. It's dangerous for, for all of us because these are hotbeds of tensions. And uh, on the other hand, we need to get certain experience, new experience of cooperation, which we really lack. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irina. That was uh, really a, uh, a great overview, and I think set the stage very well for Seth and Ekaterina to dive a little deeper into the questions of terrorism. So sure. I'm going to turn this over to Seth. And uh, go ahead. yes, thanks. He's um, also a co-host of this program. That's this, right. Uh, this event, by the way. Well, we'll thank, thanks to the East West Center. Center. Thanks to you, Olya. And thanks to um, my fellow panelists for um, their ability to come today and to have a frank discussion on an important subject. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a step back and look more broadly at patterns of uh, terrorists, particularly Salafi jihadist activity, and try to put U.S.-Russian um, cooperation and competition in a, broader, uh, in a broader context. I mean, I think it's certainly true, just to start off with two points, that uh, the Islamic State or Daesh has lost territorial control, not just in Iraq and Syria, but also in, in other countries where it had some control of territory. It's lost um, control of territory in Libya, including in Darna and Sirte, where it had control. It's lost, uh, it's lost control of territory from peak levels around 2014 in Afghanistan, particularly in southern Afghanistan and Helmand and Farah. Uh, it's lost from its peak levels in Nigeria, Boko Haram. So the trends are slightly downward, particularly on control of territory. Um, Al Qaeda has also struggled uh, in many ways, um, which I'll get to in a moment. But I think it's worth noting that there still remain a large number of Salafi jihadists uh, across the globe, really among the highest recorded numbers in recent history and that there are particularly large numbers in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, and in a few other locations, including if you start to include groups like the Afghan Taliban that have a relationship with Al Qaeda uh, in the Afghan Pakistan areas. So um, they don't control territory, at least at certain levels, but we see a lot of fluidity among uh, a range of locations. So I would, I would uh, push back on the notion, and we've heard it even in the U.S. national security strategy, that, that these uh, organizations have been crushed. I think they've certainly lost territory, but have strong reservations that um, they, are, they have been defeated in any meaningful way. And so I'll, 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 I'll look a little bit at the juxtaposition between decline in control and a pool of individuals uh, out there that I think are, are concerning. First, let me start with, um, with ISIS and Al-Qaeda. I think it's certainly true that they faced challenges. These are the two largest transnational uh, pan-Islamic uh, movements that compete with each other. They actually have quite similar ideologies, as we know, but they have competed with each other in a range of areas. And I think with, with, uh, with the Islamic State or, or Daesh, I think the decline in territorial control has been pretty well documented by all sides, the Syrians, the Russians, the Americans, uh, the Turks, in Iraq and Syria. Uh, it's been a combination of both state activity, 
and substate activity. So on the Iraqi context, a combination of Iraqi counterterrorism service forces, uh, local militias, and then, uh, and then European and other uh, countries that are conducting airstrikes and have special operations and conventional forces on the ground. In the Syrian context, it's a mixture of everybody involved, state and non-state, uh, where they've lost peak levels of support. The same is true in Libya, where it's been a combination of state and non-state um, activity against uh, uh, Islamic State activity in, uh, in Darna and Sirte, particularly. Um, Al-Qaeda has also faced challenges as we look at it globally. Uh, the core in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region is in what I would call survival mode. Ayman al-Zawahri has, um, um, I think, been hamstrung by his, uh, his operational security challenges. Uh, in Syria, uh, Al-Qaeda has historically had a relationship with Jabhat al-Nusra. I think if you look closely at the debates within the Salafi jihadist communities in Syria over the past year or two, there's been intense uh, discord, uh, particularly with uh, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, or HTS, where uh, Zawahiri's um, operational security has made it very difficult to provide guidance in any meaningful fashion. And so I think they're, what we've seen on the ground, particularly in the Idlib area, is a range of these groups have made a number of operational and tactical decisions essentially on their own, and in a few cases with, the, with, the, uh, with individuals like Mohammed al-Jalani in direct opposition to what Zawahri has put out. And if you look at his statements over the past several months, he has become, I think, increasingly frustrated with the core al-Qaeda's ability to provide meaningful guidance to the movement. Um, so, I, so, so there's been a lot of competition within uh, jihadist networks within Syria and other locations, and I think a lot of fracturing. What, what struck me is how many name and group changes we've seen even over the past six to eight months in, uh, in, the, in, in the Syria area. So that's the, uh, I guess the good news is uh, the Islamic State has lost control. Al Qaeda's in a bit of um, uh, in in a bit of confusion. Uh, there's been discord in the core in Pac the Afghanistan Pakistan area has been uh, has been has been really put in survival mode. Um, the downside a little bit is if you look at at some of the numbers, um, CSIS is, is putting together a database of the numbers of Salafi jihadists, including um, groups. And the numbers, I think, are telling. Uh, the database indicates that there are still, on the high side, as many as 200,000 global Salafi jihadists, which is almost at an all-time low, slightly lower than what we've seen in the last year or two. But compared to what we saw three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, we're at nearly record, uh, record highs right now. Most of these fighters are in Iraq and Syria, Libya. Uh, the Afghanistan, Pakistan theater, Somalia, Yemen are probably the primary battlefields uh, where we see these. They aren't always coming under the umbrella of, uh, of ISIS, Daesh, or, or Al Qaeda, but they are operating uh, with local groups in a range of these areas. Roughly 65 active groups um, along these uh, same battlefields uh, on multiple continents. And there is substantial fluidity, I think, between and within these categories. Syria is really a useful example because we've seen a constant series of rebranding, fissures between jihadists, some splintering defections, but where there is still a pretty significant pool. Um, notice, by the way, that I think uh, there were a number of countries, including the US, that were concerned about a significant return of foreign fighters to places like Europe. Uh, for the most part, those numbers have been much lower than most people anticipated. Uh, there has been an exodus of fighters to a few locations, including the Caucasus, uh, almost certainly the Balkans, uh, and then some areas of Africa, including Libya and the Horn. But the numbers are relatively low compared to at least predictions in South Asia. I just got back yesterday from West Africa. The number of foreign fighters in the Sahel is much lower. There's a lot of movement in in and among battlefields in Africa, including the uh, Nigeria, Libya, Somalia, and the Sahel areas, including northern Mali. 
but not a lot of movement, not a ton of movement from the Iraq Syria into those areas. But, but again, you know, I, I think it's helpful. We as um, analysts and I think governments like to put these groups into uh, categories. You know, we like to call them Group X or Group Y. And I think it's important to understand that we're really dealing at the micro level with sort of fluid networks uh, and lots of changes in names, but pretty large numbers right now. So I think this leads to a range of key questions that, uh, that are worth considering, uh, particularly on, uh, on the US-Russian uh, uh, radar screens. The first is, um, is Turkey, and, and how will Turkey be impacted by um, some of the near-term battlefield efforts against these groups, um, particularly in Syria and Iraq? Um, I, I certainly think uh, Damascus, there's been a push in eastern Ghouta and Damascus. There will be over the uh, 2018, I'm pretty sure, in Idlib as well. Um, where are these individuals going to go? I mean, Turkey is the closest location. Uh, Turkey, uh, there is a fairly substantial amount of evidence that Turkey has provided assistance to some of these groups, including Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, and may provide sanctuary. But I think as we've seen in Syria uh, during the uh, Iraq war post-2003, you know, there are always opportunities for blowback when uh, states uh, allow groups to operate on their territory. So I think there are a range of questions about stability of Turkey if we see a decline in um, territorial control, particularly in the Idlib area of Syria, thanks to a range of operations, including Syrian government and Russian operations against them. Uh, a second question is, will we see collectively a change, particularly among groups like Al-Qaeda, a shift towards more external operations? They focus predominantly on fighting local areas uh, in Syria with Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, uh, with, um, uh, with Yemen, for example. The focus is mostly on fighting the near enemy um, and trying to inspire attacks in the West or in Russia. Will we see groups start to migrate towards more uh, attempts to, to get directly involved in external operations. I think that's, a, that's an open question right now. It would certainly be concerning if we did. And then finally, uh, just on questions, I think my most serious concern moving por forward, and I think there are probably opportunities for both the Russians and the uh, Americans to, to A, identify and find ways to start to ameliorate our governance challenges. I think all of the countries I identified, including Syria and Iraq, uh, Yemen, Libya, have substantial governance uh, challenges. As long as there are governments that are weak, ineffective, illegitimate in many cases, there will be opportunities for groups to use that territory for sanctuary um, and to conduct attacks in those countries and also use them for a launching pad externally. I see no, I see very limited optimism that um, in, the, in the next two to three years, so for the immediate short term, we're likely to see significant improvements in governance, especially legitimacy of the populations in most of those countries. And I think there's a very serious counterterrorism. it's not just a military effort, um, but broader diplomatic, um, uh, and development need to build more competent and effective governments in the range of these areas, or we will continue to face these uh, problems. I mean, I mean, even in Syria, our estimates are still between 30 and 50,000 jihadists in Syria that, that may move across the border into Turkey. And if we don't have effective governments in these areas, we will, I, I just don't think we're going to get uh, much progress. So let me conclude um, with a couple of final points. Um, I, I think the US has got to be really careful. If you look at the national defense strategy, that it doesn't try to move on too quickly uh, away from counterterrorism towards state-based competition, which if, the, if you read the um, national defense strategy, uh, counterterrorism gets a backseat. Uh, the priority is against state-based threats, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran. And, and, and I think, um, Again, based on my comments earlier that there remain significant challenges on the terrorism side that, that uh, Washington not move too quickly. I think it's also worth noting that um, um, there will be, whether we like it or not, this is not a, this is not a uh, policy prescription. I think it's just a reality. There will be competition between Moscow and Washington in a number of areas. 
Uh, they have different interests. They have different groups they're working with on the ground. They have an interest in um, trying to maximize their own security and economic interests. So I think that will put them to some degree in competition in Syria, uh, particularly with the Russian-Iranian relationship. I think it puts them to some degree in a bit of competition in South Asia, particularly with the US military presence there and in Central Asia. Uh, there may be competition in Libya where the Russians and the Americans have competed over even individuals like Haftar and the relationship with uh, various um, uh, factions within Libya. So uh, there will be competition, uh, but there are also, uh, and this is my com uh, concluding remark, I think there will be and there have to be avenues for cooperation. Uh, both countries have a substantial interest and should in, and they have common interest in targeting groups like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. They both present threats. <laughs> both consider Moscow and Washington enemies. Uh, and so I think they have a reason and a need to share um, intelligence and to work together against those groups. So where they have common interests, I think there is a need to continue to talk and um, share information and then to cooperate. Um, peace settlement in Afghanistan, I think they have a mutual interest in uh, trying to establish some kind of a settlement. So my broader point, just to summarize, is I think while groups like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State have faced some unsettling times, there are simply a, a number of networks still operating on multiple fronts. And I think if you put the U.S.-Russian relationship in a broader context, and other things outside of just counterterrorism, there will be competition. We should expect that. But I also think there are, there are um, avenues of potential cooperation. Thank you. Th thank you, Seth. I, I am struck uh, two panelists then to this discussion of the future of terrorism, how little terrorism has come up. Uh, we've, we've, talked, we've, talked a lot of, we've talked a lot about insurgency. We've talked a bit about great power competition. So I'm very glad that Katsidina is, uh, is our final speaker because I, I strongly suspect she's going to bring this back uh, to terrorism, the actual tactic, as opposed to the groups, the insurgent groups that are what we really worry about, but uh, who may or may not use that tactic. So. Insurgency and terrorism are not mutually exclusive because these tactics can be practiced by the same movement. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, well, our panel's title, uh, the way it sounds in your booklets, whatever, suggests uh, its primary focus on transnational terrorism. But the part of the title I have a slight problem with, Olga, is after Syria. Because okay. we're not because, past Syria, because, yes. Uh, uh, I mean, even defeat of uh, ISIS caliphate uh, does not yet imply, uh, does not yet mean the end of the conflict, mm -hmm. you know, transnational civil war in uh, Syria or Iraq. So um, uh, probably what was uh, implied here really mm -hmm. was after the caliphate, after Daesh as mm -hmm. we knew it at its peak. Uh, what happens after? And uh, that leads me to two questions, uh, which I will try to answer to the best of my capacity. Uh, one is, uh, how does the challenge of transnational terrorism evolve uh, after the demise of uh, ISIS physical core in Iraq and Syria? And second, what are, uh, are the related problems for international cooperation on anti-terrorism, particularly in the Russia West, uh, Russia US uh, context? Both are vast subjects, you know, uh, so we we'll have to be selective. So on question one, uh, I'll try to focus on uh, uh, how much change could we expect in global terrorism patterns after uh, Daesh as we know it is gone, as the, at least its physical sort of core. Um, uh, and uh, on question two, I will actually argue that the main impediment, the main complication in uh, um, international cooperation on anti-terrorism globally has nothing to do with the East-West, this new East-West divide. Nothing. You know, although it has important implications for the Russia-West, Russia-US uh, relations. So on question one, uh, up until the present day, uh, international terrorism uh, in this century, basically in the 20, early 21st century, has been dominated, we all know, by terrorism of radical Islamist bent. That was not the only form, but that was the dominant form. But the thing is that the main layer 
main in terms of uh, intensity of terrorist activity, the core okay, of this type of terrorism was not formed by any single group, uh, nor by a, even by a single micro network. Uh, the, the real layer, the most problematic layer of terrorist activity of this type has been formed by uh, a handful of uh, no more than six, seven regionally based uh, militant movements, all engaged in uh, major armed conflicts in the Middle East, South Asia, and East and Central Africa. Okay? This, uh, uh, these movements are distinct. Uh, they uh, generated in different uh, regions, they uh, emerged in different contexts, but they share many typological similarities. Uh, they are all in Muslim states or in Muslim populated regions. So Nigeria is a Muslim minority state, but a large Muslim minority state, for instance. But mostly Muslim regions. Um, they are all regionally based and absolutely endemic to their regions. So they may have developed uh, vast, uh, solid transnational connections, but they remain the products of their regional context. They are endemic to their regions. Um, uh, they all are in weak, uh, based and operate in weak or failed, failing states, often uh, surrounded also by a couple of weak and failed states. They all um, aspire to build alternative systems of governance, Islamic states, in their regions, not just in any single country, in their regions. Uh, and they all combine active combat, intense combat in, uh, against uh, government or, and or foreign armed and security forces in the context of the world's uh, lead most intense uh, armed conflicts with their lead role as terrorist uh, actors uh, globally. Uh, to, to give you an idea, uh, I mean, we have statistics, empirical basis more or less solid on terrorism. 74% uh, uh, as of the mid, uh, middle of this decade, which is basically now. 74% yeah? of all terrorist fatalities are uh, accounted for, uh, caused by just these six, seven groups. 74% of all fatalities by identified group. And that's basically ISIS, the Taliban, Boko Haram, um, Ash-Shabaab, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, and uh, AKIM, Akim, the Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb. Uh, sometimes one more is added depending on the year, but it's, it's, just, uh, it's just them. And, Frank, and Daesh uh, is not always the lead actor, not on all parameters, not every year. I mean, Daesh is frequently outmatched by other actors of this group. So for instance, it was uh, the, the most deadly group, uh, terrorist group, Daesh, in uh, 2016, the latest year for which data is available. But in the very same year, Jafat al uh, led by uh, average lethality <laughs> per single attack, you know, the highest in the world, 12 people, people killed per attack. Uh, Boko Haram uh, effectively overtook Daesh a couple of times, so for instance in 2014, as the most deadly terrorist group in the world. Taliban, in principle, leads as a chief terrorist sector because it was just active longer if you take the, this entire period of the early 21st century. So that, that, that is the lead uh, actor, uh, and so on. So uh, what made, made ISIS, ISIS belongs to this group uh, by its history, how it formed, you know? Uh, they all, all this movement went through bottom-up regionalization, starting from something more localized, subnational, and then going cross-border, and then uh, getting regionalized. The only reason, uh, the main reason ISIS stand, uh, stood out is not uh, the intensity of its terrorist activity. It's comparable to other groups of this, of this type. Uh, the reason it stood out, of course, is that it went far beyond. It extended its state building, Islamic state building <laughs> ambitious, uh, beyond not just Syria and Iraq, but beyond the Middle East, and uh, grew, out, uh, grew up into a category of, of its own. So basically, ISIS is a, is a cumulative product, yes, of, uh, certainly of this bottom-up regionalization as one trend, but overall, I would say, of three trends in uh, transnational terrorism. One is bottom-up regionalization. Second, I call it uh, uh, network fragmentation of global jihad. 
uh, which happens everywhere, but mostly in regions outside the Muslim world. In the developed world, you see this you know, fragmentation. And then, of course, this uh, intensified, uh, targeted uh, flows of jihadists uh, within the region and between, across regions, cross regional flows. Uh, these these uh, trends are interrelated, yeah, but they are distinct. They may be rooted in different contexts, uh, they may develop in parallel, and they only partially overlap. The problem is that it is exactly where they overlap, all three, you know, at the interface of all three that you get Daesh, uh, the way we knew it at, at, its, uh, at its peak. Uh, basically, a centrifugal system with physical, territorially based caliphate in Syria and Iraq as at its core, reinforced by inflows of uh, fighters and settlers from the Middle East and from beyond the Middle East, and uh, uh, extending its propaganda, influence, ideology, whatever, uh, to many localized groups in other parts of the world, micro cells of jihadists in the developed world, uh, individual adepts, and, and so on and so forth. Now, the demise of ISIS core in Syria and Iraq. Uh, yes, it may uh, not be complete, I agree. It may have some aftershocks, as uh, Seth just explained to us. Uh, but, but frankly, it more or less brings an end to Daesh as this uh, uh, ambition to have a global caliphate, because that is co completely dependent on controlling significant territory in the historical lands of the caliphate. I don't want to go deep into this, but it's basically an end of this centrifugal sort of system of this claim. However, uh, it does not necessarily change the overall pattern that I've described, the broader <coughs> pattern. So there's very, uh, there are very solid grounds to expect that in the foreseeable future, the bulk of global terrorist activity will still be produced by a certain type of movement. You know, this uh, the l relatively large, uh, territorially, regionally based movements uh, combining uh, combat with terrorist activity in the course of major armed conflicts uh, in, in, in primarily in the Muslim world. So I don't see any grounds to suggest that this pattern is uh, likely to radically change. And I think this is a more important finding than whether I, uh, ISIS would be replaced by any, whether it's Al-Qaeda sort of coming back again to sort of reassert itself. Or it's, there, there's not gonna be a single replacement. We're dealing with a, uh, a complex thing, a number of uh, uh, conflicts. Uh, uh, second, moving to the second question, which is uh, international cooperation. What does it mean for international cooperation on terrorism? Well, uh, international cooperation on anti-terrorism uh, faces many, many impediments, many constraints. Uh, I don't even want to go into the list of anything from geostrategic rivalries, n not just east-west, you know, at any regional balance, look at any regional context, the same thing. Uh, sometimes domestic political imperatives uh, interfere. There are ubiquitous double standards, uh, you know, one man's freedom fight and other man's terrorism, so on and so forth. Yeah? But I would argue that the main complication here um, is actually far more serious at the global level. Uh, it points to a sharp contrast, uh, a colossal disproportion, so a major dividing line which is not along the east-west divide at all which is, uh, well, not exactly north-south, but I, I would rather say a, a divide between the developed West plus, you know, OECD, uh, a bit broader than the West, the developed world on the one hand, and then uh, uh, several areas of major armed conflicts in the Muslim world on the other. Uh, and this divide manifests itself, manifests itself in uh, extremely uneven distribution of terrorist activity, uh, of physical harm, suffering from terrorism, uh, between these two worlds, if you like. So just to briefly give an example, 94% uh, of people die from terrorism in, uh, Middle East, in the Middle East, in South Asia, and in Eastern Central, uh, in Central Africa. 94%. So not in the global West. <laughs> 
nor in the East, however you define it, Russia, East Asia, China, Eurasia, Asia, whatever. You know, they, 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 they die in these parts of the world. Furthermore, if you just uh, go beyond fatalities, look at uh, several parameters of terrorist activity, aggregate them, 90% of all terrorist activity is accounted for by just top 10 countries on Global Terrorism Index. Uh, those who want to read out about it, please do consult it, it's all open. Uh, just just ten, ten, top 10 states, none of them are, uh, are Western states. None of the top 20 uh, in the world are, are Western states. Uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, war torn Iraq and Afghanistan, they lead absolutely by all counts uh, in this century as the two countries most affected, heavily affected by terrorism, followed by conflicts in Syria, Nigeria, and Pakistan. So together, these just five countries in the world account for two thirds of all people killed in terrorist, uh, in terrorist attack. Uh, a step aside, immediately what this high concentration uh, of so much terrorist activity globally in just few areas and in the hands of just not that many handful of groups, what does it imply for international cooperation on anti-terrorism? Well, the implication is obvious. If we want to reduce terrorism globally, because so much of it is accounted by just this six, seven groups, let's concentrate on these groups first. Let's pull ourselves together and concentrate on them first. And a good example, this is what happened. So even if you increase pressure internationally, regionally, you know, or best of all, of course, at national, regional, and international level, even against one or two such groups, you immediately see a very substantial <laughs> Reduction in global terrorism, uh, you know, indicators. This is what happened in the past two years uh, in Syria due to increased international pressure, wherever it comes from. Uh, increased international pressure on ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra, and in Nigeria, mostly because of national and regional regional efforts. They they cooperate, uh, have excellent uh, sort of case of international cooperation against regional cooperation against terrorism. But just these two. <laughs> helped reduce uh, terrorist fatalities by 22% in, the, in just two years, since the peak, absolute historical peak in uh, uh, 2014. You know? So no matter uh, what happens between Russia and the United States, okay, no matter how they hate each other on other matters, whether you like it or not, but they both actively contributed to this decline through their military campaigns in, uh, in Syria. Yes, not uncoordinated. Yes, in absence of direct cooperation, but through parallel efforts with at least one shared goal, anti-ISIS. Yeah? Coming back to this colossal disproportion globally that I was talking about, uh, with so much activity concentrated in just these several areas of major armed conflicts. Well, in contrast, of course, what we see in the OSCD world, in the developed world, well, in 2016, that accounted for just 1% of global terrorist fatalities. Well, again, that's not the impression, uh, and we're coming to the reverse disproportion here. You know? There is a disproportion in physical manifestation, and there is a disproportion in political effect, mm -hmm. political media effect that these at uh, attacks have on uh, uh, world politics, security, global anti-terrorism agenda, and you see a reverse disproportion. Oh, of course, because uh, uh, again, f uh, the, this indirect, broader, politically destabilizing uh, effect of terrorism depends very much on the comparative centrality of a particular context to the world politics. And the West is simply more central. This is why despite minimal, I would say minuscule, manif direct manifestation and harm from terrorism in the developed world, any attack, more or less significant attack in Paris, London, Madrid, uh, Nice, Brussels, Orlando, whatever, uh, immediately get overwhelms global media, you know, grasps the bulk of uh, political media attention uh, compared to far more frequent and far more deadly attacks anywhere in Kabul, uh, Baghdad, Mogadishu, uh, Bamako, Lahore, uh, uh, you name it. 
I am coming. I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> to wrapping up. Uh, uh, but but uh, the problem is that uh, this, uh, well, f you can see few, you know, minimal manifestations of terrorism in the West because of its centrality to global scene and whatever. They also have a disproportionate uh, influence on global anti terrorism agenda. So, for instance, some of the issues which are sp uh, or concerns which are specific to a developed Western uh, society, uh, radicalization of the second generation of migrants, uh, I don't know, the emergence of self-generating micro-cells of jihadist type, anti-migrant right, the rise of anti-migrant right-wing violence. Uh, they may be damn important for the West, but uh, frankly, they are hardly... <laughs> Uh, of, of, they're hardly a priority and hardly even relevant <laughs> for much of the rest of the world, and particularly for those countries which suffer incomparably more from both direct manifestations of terrorism and from broader consequences of armed conflicts at the same time. And they have every right to claim that their uh, concerns are underrepresented in a way in global anti-terrorism agenda, especially since these countries also lack resources to effectively address the threat, and some of them even lack the sheer minimal level of state functionality required to sort of uh, counter terrorism and even to, to, to implement those anti-terrorism obligations that they sign up, uh, sign up for. So uh, globally, uh, there is a huge need to bridge this gap somehow, because it's, a, it's an objective uh, you know, gap. And I think Russia, actually, as being somewhere between <laughs> the two worlds, you know, has uh, maybe one of the uh, countries that can play a role in bridging this gap, uh, given that uh, making anti global anti-terrorism agenda more balanced against this colossal disproportion. Because Russia, on the one hand, it's a major player at the UN, member of the UN Security Council, permanent member, a champion, one of the champions along, lead Western states along some other states of India, uh, you know, non-Western states as well, of anti-terrorist agenda at the UN, and at the same time, clearly a non-Western power. If there were any doubts about it, they should be gone by now. Yeah? Uh, it's also, uh, in terms of uh, vulnerability to terrorism, Russia is actually, it, it, it went through okay. the worst. I'm, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, uh, it's like the last sentence. Okay. Yeah, Russia, <laughs> Russia went through the worst. I mean, it was the only country, not former third world country, that actually made it into the top ten earlier this century. The only one. Uh, it, and it was also the only one that uh, effectively improved. Its, its position on GDI, on all these indices, by falling out of the first of the first 10, top 10, then of the top 20, then from the top 30, and by now, uh, if you look at objective indicators, GDI is doing better than in either the United States or France. Okay? So Russia is ideally positioned to do that. Just uh, to conclude, uh, <laughs> if we come back to the fact that lions, because I think it connects us back to what Irina was talking, to actual armed conflicts and, uh, and explains Olga your question of why so much talk about things other than terrorism. About uh, if we come back to the fact that the lion's share of global terrorist activity is linked to the agenda and to the context of armed conflicts, major armed conflicts of a very specific type. It's uh, they are typologically similar. This context, uh, these conflicts, they are. Uh, very intense, the most intense in the world, heavily transnationalized civil wars in weak or failing uh, states, in, mostly in the Muslim world. Okay? Th this fact, uh, this should be the best uh, evidence in favor of uh, pointing you know, to the need to qualitatively upgrade uh, international capacity to, to address, to fundamentally resolve this type of conflict and pre prevent new ones of this type. And whether this task could be solved without improved relations along the East-West divide, especially on Syria and Afghanistan, that's a big question. It is supposed to be an open question to the audience, but my answer, short answer, of course, is no. Okay. Unless you improve, <laughs> you get some normalization along the East-West. Uh, line in, in certain places you simply are not getting anywhere. Uh, 
I have to stop here. Okay. Thanks for your patience. No, thank you. No, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I think um, this really sets, the, I think uh, Katerina's presentation set the stage nicely for a couple of questions I want to ask uh, all of you. Um, uh, so I want to press Irina uh, on the question of Iran and Iran's interests. You indicated that it's not, um, it's not entirely clear where it's going to go. I wonder what Russia, what you think Russia's interests are in, in terms of where Iran will go and how much influence Russia has over Iran to attain those in, interests. Um, and then for Seth and Ekaterina, actually the, the same question to an extent, because you, you, both, um, you both touched on this. Um, I think it, uh, Ekaterina made the very convincing case that most terrorism, in the sense of terrorism, not insurgency, but terrorism, is the product, is the work of a small number of groups in a very, in their own neighborhoods, let's say, in, you know, where, where they live. Um, so my question to the two of you is twofold. One is, what proportion of these group strategies is terrorism vice insurgency, particularly now after the defeat of ISIS? And is their focus on their neighborhood a matter of ease and opportunity, or is it, um, is it intentional? When they target, you know, is it that they target Western countries rarely because you do get so much bang for the buck there, so you don't need to target them more often, or would they target them more if they could? Because um, I think that speaks to uh, some of the ways that we in Washington and I also think in Moscow are trying to assess the danger and the threat. So, uh, Well, uh, first of all, I would say that since the conflict is not over, and unfortunately it seems it will last for some indefinite time, so we cannot say what the end game for Iran will be in Syria. We can suspect, of course, that since Iran contributed to, the <clears throat> to this situation in Syria and I mean precluded the rise of the jihadists and they are coming to power and somehow also helped to save Assad. So from this point of view, we can say that Iran will be very much interested to getting for something in return. What, what can it be? There can be bases, installations, mm -hmm. uh, presence, military presence, whatnot. But it will, uh, will not be that easy because, uh, in fact, the game here, as I said, is ambivalent, as it is always ambivalent in the Middle East. Because on the one hand, of course, he helped Assad to stay in power. But if Assad gets strong enough, he wouldn't allow them to, to stay in his soil. He would be the first to get rid of Iran because it, it will become a threat to, from the domestic point of view. As far as Russia is concerned, as I have already said, we are not interested in the division of Syria. We supported the idea again of 2254 that sh there should be a unified Syria. And the efforts of the regional powers to identify their zones of interest, like Turkey is doing, like Iran is doing, I believe it is detrimental to the political settlement. As far as Russian leverage is concerned, you know, uh, well, I believe that under certain conditions it might be used, but unfortunately the background is very unfavorable for it because uh, the ambitions of Iran in Syria has increased against the background of the United States and European countries, some European countries, just exerting pressure on it and uh, threatening to undermine the deal, the nuclear deal. So, you know, this is a very complicated game. And uh, Iran will take advantage of all these differences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna Sorry. sort of differentiate between focus on the far enemy, uh -huh. the West, Russia, and the near enemy, um, rather than sort of terrorism and insurgency. So how, how much, I mean, I, I think the evidence is overwhelming that the vast majority of violence is happening uh, by local groups in the countries within which they're operating. I mean, that's, whether you look at the data from Jane's or START or ACLIT or any of the databases, it overwhelmingly shows the vast majority of the violence is directed at near enemy regimes 
and then um, countries operating against them in, in Somalia, for example. Al-Shabaab's primary regional terrorism is directed at the Kenyans in particular, at the Ethiopians, because they're the lead efforts on the ground. So the vast, but here's the challenge, um, and, and, and I think this is where, this is where um, the, uh, this, is, this becomes an issue for states outside of that. So whether it's in Moscow or Paris or Washington, um, and, and that is a, a few things. One is, um, is when you look at the leadership of virtually all of these groups. So I, I'm, I'm gonna call some of these groups sort of within the Al Qaeda sphere in part because they've pledged bayat or allegiance to um, Zawahri. So if you look at his statements, and some of their actions, if you look at uh, Hamza bin Laden's statements recently, even over the last few weeks, if you look at the leadership comments from al-Shabaab, uh, if you look at some of the comments from the leadership of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, or JNIM in West Africa, uh, they, they do focus on enemies being both internal in the areas where they're uh, targeting, and also the countries that are supporting them overseas. And this is why we get uh, attacks against the French in Burkina Faso, for example. It's because they tie those two together. It's not just the regimes locally where we see most of the violence happening, but it's also their supporters wherever they are, Moscow or, or Paris or, or Washington or London. So I, I think there is some tie uh, between those organizations. Now, we've seen uh, these groups then do uh, two kinds of things to tie the conflicts together. One is inspire attacks in the West, and I think this is where uh, Daesh, uh, based on its social media and a range of other factors, has been more successful than other groups in inspiring attacks in the West. I would not underestimate, as we've seen in France in the past two years, the ability for individuals to be um, uh, inspired. Sure, the numbers in France and in Europe are much smaller than they are in Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, but it is the dominant theme in French, uh, in, in French society. It's the most significant threat that the state assesses it has right now. It comes from uh, jihadist groups operating both internally but also outside in that, in that connection. Second, uh, involvement in plots, uh, plots directed and in, in, uh, the Paris November 2015 attack is an example of where we see that connection between individuals plotting in the Middle East and going to, uh, in that case, Paris to conduct the attack. Um, the pressure that has been put on these two broader networks by uh, outside powers, the U.S. special operations, British, French, and even Russian operations has, for the moment, degraded the external operations capabilities of these groups. There, in the last several years, we've seen um, up in the Idlib area, external plotting uh, into Europe. Uh, we've seen a number of uh, individuals that have been, uh, uh, Musan al-Fadli, for example, uh, plotting attacks, was killed by strikes. In that, in that case, it's a U.S. strike. So uh, I, I think these two are in many ways tied. And the challenge I see, and the, the Taliban is a very good example of this. We've seen in areas that the Taliban has controlled uh, an increase in uh, al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent activity more recently in uh, Helmand around the Baram Cha area and then up in northern Helmand. So I, I see um, a continuing uh, burning of these uh, wars, these local wars, and terrorist violence in these countries, uh, as long as they continue, there will, and I think there continue to be connections and a desire both to focus on attacking uh, the regimes in the countries they're operating, as well as to target, if they can, the groups that are providing assistance, or the countries that are providing assistance to those regimes, and I think that means Look at the statements very specifically of Zawahri and bin Laden, Hamza bin Laden and Baghdadi. They target in their words, and I think in plotting, Moscow and Paris and, and Washington and London along those lines. So if we don't deal effectively with these burning conflicts, I think we continue to risk threats, however small in percentage of number they face. Okay, thank you. Next um, First of all, a, a slight correction. Uh, 
we're not talking about all sorts of local groups active in their neighborhood, uh, respective neighborhoods. When we talk about the critical layer, sort mm -hmm. of uh, the most dangerous, if you like, layer of uh, transnational terrorists, we talk about, uh, well, it's neither flat extraterritorial Al-Qaeda style networks, you know, with no mm -hmm. territorial base or not linked specifically to any particular country, uh, nor, uh, nor it is uh, an array, a wide uh, variety of, say, um, uh, Islamist slash separatist uh, groups uh, fighting on the periphery of otherwise relatively functional states, mostly in Asia and Eurasia, mostly Muslim minority states, who have pla they, they dominate numerically. You know, there are more of them, <laughs> many more. But uh, first of all, they uh, to their respective function, more or less functional states: Russia, China, India. Thailand, the Philippines. I mean, for us, in, should I say this? This for us in Asia, you know. For us in Asia, you know, it does not. It's a very standard uh, thing. Almost every second country <laughs> has this problem. But uh, yes, it's a problem at the national level. Yes, they may have international connections and so on and so forth. But if the state is functional, it will manage more or less. Sometimes it would in, in, even intentionally kind of prefer not to have a final solution of that problem because that is given the degree of fragmentation, low scale of violence is not even always possible, you know, and uh, root causes uh, that uh, continue to create these problems, they may take decades to address. Like in the North Caucasus, they will take decades to, to, to evaporate, for the violence to evaporate completely. It, it's a long-term process. You need to do a whole lot of things, improve governance, improve administration, uh, create jobs, a lot of things, you know. So, so the strategy is containing it at a relatively low, low scale level, you know, not letting it uh, grow, you know. And the functional state can allow this, can afford to do this, and often does not even need a major external support to do this. No, the problem we're talking about is uh, is posed by movements of a different type. That, uh, first of all, that operate, there's a clear problem here and a link to, to, state, to state failure. In the Middle East, that's one of the main uh, features of the systemic crisis that the, uh, I don't want to preclude what Irina can say <laughs> about this, but basically there's a crisis of uh, state, fundamental mm -hmm. crisis of state in the Middle East, and that's one of the core uh, problems here. Uh, so uh, there are many other issues involved if you are dealing with uh, groups that combine, uh, they're not purely terrorist actors, they are pr most of them are prioritized combat over uh, terrorist means, uh, especially groups like Taliban. I know we've spent the last two days actually in showing uh, the terrorists, yes, uh, they, are, they remain the main terrorist sector in Afghanistan, if outmatching uh, this new ISIS uh, branch there, whatever. But, but uh, in their activity, combat clearly, clearly dominates. Uh, so th the problem is that movements like that, they're very hard, th 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 there's not much you can do about them without, you know, changing something fundamental, without uh, and it's very hard to uh, defeat them militarily just by mobilizing uh, external international support. The only reason that was possible in Syria and Iraq is because the movement went out of its region. It started to present a global problem and created the necessary degree of international consensus to, to uh, Western Arab coalition, a very broad coalition, Russia, a separate coalition, but never, nevertheless, you know, this is probably the broadest you can have, you know. Uh, but but in, uh, if, if the movement, like the Taliban, does not have any particular goals beyond the Afghan-Pakistani sort of area, you know, beyond its uh, area of operation, uh, you know, it's very hard to, to mobilize. Uh, if, it's, if it enjoys uh, a degree of support from neighboring countries, uh, if there's a complex regional balance, uh, there's, there's not much you can do to defeat it militarily. I think w w in most of these cases, actually, Somalia, Afghanistan, even Libya, there's no clear military solution mm -hmm. to the problem, which means that it all brings us back to fundamental things, you know, um, uh, and uh, resolving, uh, fi uh, trying to find a solution to, to respective armed conflicts where these 
groups are major parties. They are usually the main armed opposition force, uh, which means addressing key incompatibilities over which the conflict has been fought, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so the, the, uh, they present the main challenge you know, at all levels, national, regional, and uh, international. Thank you. Okay, so we don't have a lot of time. So what I'm going to do is take um, four questions and then come back to our panelists to respond to them and uh, any, uh, say anything additional uh, over here in the gray. Uh, please wait for the microphone. Please identify yourself um, and please do, for, do ask a question. Yeah. Hello, thank you very much for your interesting uh, discussion. Tatiana Klomako with Reno Stenius Agency. Uh, my, my question is, a little bit different from the topic, it's about political settlement and specifically uh, Geneva talks. I just want to ask your opinion. Um, it's uh, acknowledged by all the sides that Geneva talks uh, is now in the deadlock and uh, Syrian opposition as well, they, uh, they said so. Do you see any alternative to this format uh, or do you see any, anything that can uh, uh, renew this process and uh, just to, um, to force it to, to bring something uh, something new to the table. Thank you very much. Thank you, okay. Um, over here. Hi, thanks for uh, coming. It's, it's not often that we get to hear a Russian perspective from kind of a first-hand account. So my question is, you alluded to diverging objectives within Syria between Russia and the US, and I just wanted to see if you could speak to what would be considered an optimal solution within Syria from a Russian perspective, and where do you see the differences between an optimal US solution? Thank you. Okay. And uh, let's go to the back. Hi, Alexander Naum of uh, George Mason University. My question is about the recent statements from the head of the U.S. forces in Afghanistan alleging that Russia helps support the Taliban. Is there any kind of evidence or attrib attribution for this? And regardless of that, what does this mean for the future of counterterrorism cooperation between the U.S. and Russia if one of the most senior U.S. officials on counterterrorism makes this kind of statement? Thank you. And final question here in the front. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so Jabbar from uh, Voice of America, uh, writer and journalist uh, working in the Kurdish service. Yeah, uh, I have a two question. How about the new version of jihadist and Salafi, Salafism in backed by Turkish government Erdoganism after Afrin destroyed by the, by this, uh, type of uh, military military attack. And uh, the second one is uh, defeating ISIS by, in Syria by YPJ, uh, the Kurdish fighter with the USA, was a big politic victory of, for v USA, right? USA and coalition. But USA, by their silence, give the green light to Turkey to control Afrin, the city and killing people, looting, destroying the city. What's the question? Yeah, by Turkish gov government. Yeah. So, what's your question? The question is uh, the green light from. Is it a green light? Okay. Yeah, yeah, the green light. Okay, so let's uh, go back in reverse order uh, with the city in the first. Uh, answer what you want, uh, as you want, and if you have final comments, but uh, keep in mind, we have about two minutes each. <laughs> Maybe okay. three. Well, then, uh, I don't know, telegraph style, but I'll pick up some of, uh, some of the things. Uh, Geneva talks uh, on Syria. Uh, Russia has been supportive of Geneva talks throughout, you know, one of the primary backers. Furthermore, I would say that the, uh, Russia brokered, uh, the one, co -bro uh, the format co-brokered by Russia uh, Turkey and Iran, the Astana ceasefire format, uh, one of its main goals, as I see it, was to prepare technical grounds <laughs> for Geneva because it addressed uh, three main issues which prevented previous rounds of Geneva talks to start in earnest, to, to reach some progress, which was all previous Geneva, uh, several years of Geneva uh, talks uh, rounds. Uh, they did not involve uh, major players on the ground, they involve emigre, bunches of uh, bunches of emigres, uh, mostly, yeah? 
Um, they did not account sufficiently for interest of key regional players, and they were not based of la on lasting ceasefires. So Astana, th the point of Astana was to address all these three issues, to bring together really veto players on the ground, and it did, and even Jaysh islam and Asham and others came, uh, radical groups, you know, on the opposition. Uh, it did, of course, account for regional interest because it was co-brokered by Turkey and Iran. Uh, and uh, uh, and it, uh, it did uh, create grounds for uh, a ceasefire which, may I say, held uh, comparably better, you know, than all previous ones. Despite all the violations, it was the longest uh, holding uh, and remains the longest holding ceasefire. So uh, in that sense, uh, Russia, but, but you must realize that uh, Astana, that ceasefire talks. They do not address uh, even, even humanitarian situation properly. They, and, and let alone po main issues, political issues, you know, the future of the country, the tra political transition, all the things that UN uh, Security Council resolution prescribed and so on. So that's the job for Geneva. Uh, which is why Russia uh, will continue to support uh, Geneva talks. It tried to help in another way by arranging the Sochi track two thing, you know, inviting broader range of uh, people, tribal leaders, you know, uh, well, the Kurds who uh, sh did not, could not come up, came, uh, come, they came in personal capacity, but uh, trying to engage uh, sort of a broader range of people in dialogue, preliminary dialogue about what kind of Syria. Uh, and there's not enough, not merely enough of this dialogue uh, among Syrians, you know, about what kind of uh, country they want. So Russia will continue to support it. Uh, does, uh, I'm entering a tricky sort of area, a shaky sort of ice, but uh, um, is, is Russia ready to support it indefinitely? You know, if, if Geneva talks can, uh, uh, remain stalled forever, you know, if there's no progress forever, well, uh, uh, because Russia is firmly set, I think, on diminishing its direct presence in Syria and its ownership of the Syria problem, I think it will consider other exit options. It would certainly prefer an honorable exit through a UN-mediated peace settlement, okay, but, but if not, it will consider other exit options. Not complete exit, you know, keeping w some of the gains that uh, it made through the campaign, a couple of bases and so on, but, but uh, uh, its main focus will be on diminishing its role in Syria while uh, preserving its growing influence and uh, contacts in the region, in the broader region. I probably have to stop here, although there are okay, a couple of We'll see of if other, other people yeah. can pick Let's up yeah. the other questions. So yeah, I'll briefly touch on Geneva, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the um, Taliban. Uh, on, on the Geneva, on the Geneva talks, my view is fairly cynical. Uh, we have decades of um, <laughs> examples of effective, successful peace settlements, including ones that have stuck. Uh, there are a range of factors that increase your probability of serious settlements. One of them is uh, stalemate. Um, I think one of the single biggest challenges to Geneva right now is the absence of a stalemate on the ground. I, I think the assessment from Damascus is that the regime is winning. And I think that makes it unlikely to get a serious settlement on the ground. I think in that sense, it's going to continue to fight because its prospects, I think, every day get better for a better bargaining hand. Um, maybe we'll get a settlement down the road, but uh, I, my prospects are lower the more progress on the battlefield um, occurs. On the Russia issue, this is, a, this is something I focused a fair amount on and have spent time in Afghanistan and have talked to a range of governments in the region, including the Uzbeks, Tajiks, uh, Kazakhs, the Russians themselves, Pakistan, uh, and the Afghans. So my, my, my assessment on the Russian-Taliban relationship is to have a bit of um, context here. By far the biggest backer to the Taliban remains Pakistan. This is where the leadership structure of the Taliban remains. Uh, both the Quetta Shura, also the three main regional shuras of the Taliban. 
Uh, Iran probably second in uh, as an outside state backer. Uh, Iran has allowed uh, camps in Iranian soil to be used by the Taliban. When the last Taliban leader, uh, uh, Mullah Mansour, was killed, he had just come from Iranian territory before he, he, was, uh, he was killed by a U.S. strike in Pakistan. Um, so this puts the you know, Russian assistance, and my general sense is it's been ver fa fairly limited. I mean, I think Russian objectives in Afghanistan are primarily designed to um, uh, weaken, if not destroy, ISIS. Uh, serious concerns about ISIS activity in Nangarhar and then ISIS networks in a range of places. There still is, I think, balance of power struggle with the U.S. The U.S. has a presence that's gone up in Afghanistan, south of, of Russia. The U.S. has a relationship it continues to try to develop with Central Asian states. I think this presents something of a, a strategic concern. Um, and so I think in that sense, there looks like there has been limited support and certainly contacts between the Russians and the Taliban. I think it can be overstated quite easily. Uh, I would say one of my general assumptions of the great game in Afghanistan is most major powers play not to lose, not necessarily to win. And I think if there's any way they can bog the Americans down in Afghanistan, there are a number of countries in the region that would be very happy to do that. Great, thank you, sir. Uh, last word. Uh, well, uh, as far as the uh, settlement of the Syrian conflict is concerned, I really believe that the main obstacle to it is not the United States or Western coalition, which probably didn't do a lot to, to push it forward, not Russia, who also can be accused of not doing much. But, you know, actually, we never take into consideration the positions of the locals. If you take the opposition, and if you, if you take the Assad government, the question is, are they ready for negotiated settlement? Are they ready to come to any venue which is set up for them, and they're invited, and they're not coming, they're not showing up? You know, this is the main problem, because uh, all forces, in, not only in Syria, in other states of the region, they used to be dependent on the outside powers, genetically. <laughs> Even as you know, from start from uh, Turkish, uh, Turkish uh, Osman Empire, then British Mandate, French Mandate, and so on and so forth. Then we had the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union, and they simply are not ready for anything themselves. And they believe it is very important for all of us to teach them to be responsible for the fate of their own country at last. Because if they are not ready, we cannot do much, really. Well, uh, then uh, there was a question about Russian vision of the best solution in Syria. Actually, for us, whatever will be agreed on by the Syrians themselves is fine. We're not going to dictate to them what to do. If there are elections and whoever they elect, let it be. If there is a roadmap uh, according to Tutu, Five, four, and uh, there should be a new model of constitution which would strip Assad of his powers, a man's powers, by the, by the way. Okay, then it will be easy to start with the transitional period. So uh, we would like to see unified Syria, we would like to see it stable, but uh, I'm not sure whether this dream will come true soon. Okay, on, on that uh, extremely uh, positive note, um, I thought this was a fantastic conversation. Uh, big thanks to the East West Institute, uh, to the Carnegie Corporation of New York, which uh, supports this program both um, from the uh, EWI's perspective and from CSIS Russia and Eurasia program. The Transnational Threats Program for co-sponsoring it. Our three, uh, our three wonderful panelists uh, for giving us uh, so much to think about and so much data to support their arguments. I mean, I think this was just a fantastically substantive uh, discussion and our audience. Uh, thank you all so much for being here.